Hello. In this week's Torah portion, Kitetse, we find an astounding passage. Quote, If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son, Ben Soreru More, who will not hearken to the voice of his father or to the voice of his mother, and who, even though they discipline him, will not hearken to them, then his father and his mother shall seize him and bring him out to the elders of his city and to the gate of his place. And they shall say to the elders of his city, This our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not hearken to our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. And all the men of his city shall pelt him with stones, and he shall die. So shall you remove evil from your midst, and all Israel shall hear and fear. Unquote. So, father and mother will have their son executed for not listening to them? and for being a glutton and a drunkard? These are not capital sins. In fact, they are not sins at all. There are no commandments against them. The Talmud says he must have stolen to buy all this food and drink. But even stealing is not a capital offense. Should he not even be given the opportunity to repent, to undergo teshuva? Note that if he is an adult, his parents do not have authority over him. So he must be a minor. But a minor is not responsible for the commandments. Should we execute him anyway? Something is not right here. Indeed, the sages of the Talmud state flatly, quote, this never happened and never will, unquote. <coughs> they also made sure of it by putting so many requirements before a death sentence can be carried out that it is extremely likely it ever will be. Let us review these clever requirements. First, the Torah says, a son. So if the culprit is a daughter, none of this applies. Half the people are automatically exempt. Second, only his parents can request his execution, and both must agree on it using the same words, or the case cannot proceed. The Mishnah says, quote, If the boy's father wishes to have him declared stubborn and rebellious, and his mother does not so wish, or vice versa, he is not liable, unquote. Third, if either of his parents is handicapped in a relevant way, the case cannot proceed. The Mishnah says, quote, If his father or his mother was missing a hand, or was lame, mute, blind, or deaf, he does not become a stubborn and rebellious son, because it's written in the Torah, Then his father and his mother shall seize him. This excludes those missing a hand. You need hands to seize. And bring him out. This excludes lame parents. You need to be able to walk to bring him out. And they shall say, and they shall say, this excludes the mute. This our son. This excludes the blind, because the phrase this our son implies that they see him. He will not hearken to our voice, our voice. This excludes the deaf, because they cannot hear his response when they ad admonish him. Fourth, if the boy is deaf, he is exempt because it says he will not hearken to our voice. This is not in the sources, but it's logical. Fifth is, if his parents don't have similar voices, the case cannot proceed. Quote, the Torah states, he will not hearken to our voice. This teaches that the boy's parents must have similar voices. Rabbi Yehuda even adds that the parents must also have the same appearance and height as an implication of having similar voices. Sixth, if he is below bar mitzvah age, the case cannot proceed. Quote, a minor is exempt since he has not yet entered the realm of the commandments. Unquote. Seventh, if he is older than bar mitzvah age, he is under parental control only for about three months. So all this can happen only in these three months. The Mishnah says, quote, when does a stubborn and rebellious son become liable to the death penalty? From the time that he produces two pubic hairs after the age of 13, until he has full pu pubic hair. Unquote. Eighth, if he is not properly warned and punished first, the case cannot proceed. The Mishnah says, quote, His parents must warn him before three judges, and the court must flog him. If he repeats his misdeeds afterwards, he is judged by a court of 23, which must include the original three judges, for it is stated in the Torah, This our son meaning that they can point to the original judges and say, this is the son who was flogged in your presence, unquote. 
Ninth, if he flees and is caught too late, the case cannot proceed. The Mishnah says, if the boy flees before his guilty verdict is reached, and when he is caught he has already grown full pubic hair, he is exempt. Tenth, if the boy was fathered by a minor, the case cannot proceed. Quote, the Torah says, if a man has a stubborn and rebellious son, a man, if his father is not a man, he is exempt. Eleventh, if he eats and drinks less than a specified and large amount of food and drink, all at one time, the case cannot proceed. The Mishnah says, quote, when does he become liable? When he eats a tartemar of meat and drinks half a log of Italian wine. Rabbi Yosei said, a mina of meat and a log of wine. Unquote. These are large quantities. Twelfth, if his overeating and overdrinking was while he was involved in a religious act, such as a holiday, or a celebration, such as a wedding, in the company of others, even cooks, the case cannot proceed. The Mishnah says, quote, if the boy overate and drank at a gathering that involved a mitzvah, he is not liable. Unquote. Thirteenth, if his overeating and overdrinking is not of meat and wine, the case cannot proceed. The Mishnah says, quote, If he ate any food but meat, or drank any drink but wine, he does not become a stubborn and rebellious son. He must eat meat and, and wine. Why? Because it is written, He is a glutton, zolel, and a drunkard, vesove. And it is also written in Proverbs, Do not be among wine bibbers, vesov a, among gluttonous eaters of flesh, the use of the same words implies wine and meat. Unquote. One can wonder, did the Torah use words that hint at all these exclusions on purpose, so this execution would never happen? Now, one is entitled to ask, why is this passage in the Torah at all? Commentators have speculated as follows. First, it's there only to teach us things. The Talmud says, quote, Rabbi Shimon said, there has never been a stubborn and rebellious son who was executed, and there never will be in the future. Why then was the law written? God said, study the passage and you will receive reward for doing so. Unquote. But what does it mean to say it is there only to study and receive reward? Perhaps it means to appreciate the seriousness of the problem and take action. Also, the case is so far out that it makes for captivating reading and makes Torah study more interesting. We learn by asking why such a, such a law is there and admires the rabbi's ingenuity in placing restrictions on its application. Kali Yakar from 16th century Prague offers a proof that it will never happen. Quote, when the Torah commands an execution, an announcement is made to warn the people, concluding with, so that this will never happen again. Examples are, in Deuteronomy, and all Israel shall hear and fear, and shall no longer engage in such wickedness. And again, and all the people shall hear and fear, and do no more presumptuously. But in the case of the rebellious son, there is no such statement, only, and all Israel shall hear and fear. So this cannot happen. There is no need to say, it will never happen again, because it could never have happened in the first place. Unquote. But the Talmud notes a dissenter. Quote, Rabbi Yonatan said, I saw such a son, and I sat on his grave." Unquote. However, commentators know that Rabbi Yonatan was a Kohen, and so was prohibited to touch a grave, much less sit on one. Also, it is questionable whether it is proper to sit on a grave. Maybe Rabbi Yonatan just meant to point out that it could happen. The Talmud speculates on another reason, to show that the rebellious son is likely to do terrible things in the future, so it's best if he dies now. Quote, it has been taught. Rabbi Yosei the Galilean said, Did the Torah decree that the rebellious son be brought before the court and stoned merely because he ate a tartamer of meat and drank a log of Italian wine? No. The Torah foresaw his ultimate destiny. After dissipating his father's wealth, he will still seek to seek he will still seek to maintain his bad habits, and being unable to do so, he will go to the crossroads and rob people. Therefore, the Torah said, let him die while he's still innocent and let him not die guilty of capital crimes. Unquote. Gluttony and drunkenness do indicate a lack of self-restraint. 
This points to a future lack of self-restraint on more important matters. But nevertheless, Judaism does not punish preemptively. For example, when Abraham chased away Ishmael and his mother Hagar, they were dying of thirst in the desert, but God opened up a well for them. The Torah says, God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. The Talmud interprets where he is as follows. Rabbi Yitzhak further said, man is judged only according to his actions up to the time of judgment. The Midrash asks, asks, adds, Rabbi Simon said, the ministering angels exclaimed, Lord of the universe, will you bring up a well for Ishmael, who will one day slay your children with thirst? God asked them, at this moment, what is he? Righteous, they replied. God answered, I judge man only as he is at the moment. Unquote. Besides, everyone can repent, do teshuvah, and thereby be redeemed. The psalmist writes, Though my father and my mother have rejected me, the Lord will receive me. Finally, we have free will. We do not know for sure what he will do in the future. In the Torah, God says, I have said before you life and death, blessing and curse, choose life so that both you and your seed may live. Another reason for this passage may be to teach the seriousness of lacking respect for parents, or to teach the importance of good child rearing because bad habits only get worse unless nipped in the bud, or to teach the importance for parents to agree on child rearing, or to deter juvenile misbehavior. The Torah says, all Israel shall hear and fear. Kaliyakar wonders, perhaps this passage should be taught to errant children. Abravanel writes that the passage expresses concern that the son's bad example would cause others to sin. This passage also has the salutary effect of pointing to limits of the father's power. Indeed, he needs the approval of the mother and of the court before ordering his son's execution. In other cultures, such as the ones ruled by the Hammurabi codes, a father had life and death power over his son. The Talmud also sees this passage as a warning against marrying a captive woman, Eshet Yefat Torah. She is defining the Torah as follows, quote, When the Lord your God has delivered your enemies into your hands, and you see among them a beautiful woman, and desire her, you shall do these things, and after, it, after a full month you shall go into her and be her husband, and she shall be your wife. The Torah immediately continues, if a man has two wives, one beloved and another hated, and if the firstborn son belongs to the one who is hated, he shall acknowledge the son of the hated as the firstborn and give him a double portion of all that he has, which is his due. And the Torah follows up with our paragraph, if a man has a stubborn and rebellious son, etc. The Talmud interprets this, this succession to imply that if you marry a captive woman, you will end up hating her, and the son you have from her will be a stubborn and rebellious son. Quote, Rav Yehuda said in Rav's name, interpret the proximity of verses. For in proximity to marrying the captive woman, it is written, if a man has a stubborn and rebellious son. This teaches that whoever marries a beautiful woman taken in battle will end up hating her and will have a stubborn and rebellious son from her. Unquote. King David married such a woman, Maaka, and had Avshalom who tried to kill his father and usurp his throne, slept with his wives, and caused war. Rabbeinu Bahia, 14th century Spanish scholar, believes that this passage teaches us that our love of God must supersede even our love for our children by making sure we and our children follow commandments. After all, he says, Abraham accepted God's command to sacrifice his son Isaac. My personal conclusion is that God phrased the to this Torah passage so, so as to allow many loopholes, thereby ensuring this would never happen. It is even possible to see this as evidence that God wrote the Torah, because no other known culture ever had this commandment. Shabbat Shalom.